Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Conversations on Conversations, where each week we explore a topic to help us have more powerful conversations with ourselves and others. I am your host, Sarah Noel Wilson, and this week we're going to be exploring the oft not talked about topic of end of life care. And so joining me today, I'm so I'm very excited. Joining me today is Janice Chabonic. And let me just tell you a little bit about Janice's background and also how she and I connected because it's a really fun story. And so I've been eager to have her on this conversation. Um, but she has uh, been in the healthcare field for over 30 years. In fact, she is working right now. So she may have to bounce off on the, you know, our conversation real quickly if any emergencies come up. But um, she has an undergraduate uh, and a master's in nursing and a doctorate in business administration. But she specializes in on, on, in oncology and palliative care. Um, and so one of the things that was really intriguing to me was when I had the privilege of meeting Janice, um, was hearing about the work that she's doing up in Canada related to end of life um, treatment. I don't know what the right language is. This is something you can help guide me in. But the end of life experience and and what does that look like? You know, we previously on the show had um, uh, someone who is a death doula to come talk about that experience mm. and what does it look like to support people. But this is certainly one of the topics that I feel like is very um, common for people to not want to talk about or there's ethical conversations, right, related to end of life um, opportunities or um, ways that we can best, I don't want to even say support ourselves, but to be in a position to make choices that not everyone can. Um, so welcome to the show, Janice. What else would you like folks to know about you before we talk about how we met? Oh, I, I'm a scuba diver and I love sharks. That's pretty cool. <laughs> I'm an avid <laughs> yoga chick. So yeah, yeah. Love to be upside down. <laughs> You're my first guest to say, and I love sharks. What is I it? do. What is I it about them. sharks? Um, what is it about them? When you swim by a shark, you know you're um, insignificant. <laughs> and the mm. beauty of a shark underwater, water, they are so majestic. When they swim mm. by you, you just like, oh my God goodness, what a beautiful, beautiful creature. They're so powerful. Um, but you don't want to get too close. But boy, they rule. I mean, I get excited when I see a shark. I like every, every, every time it's my birthday, and I love to go scuba diving overseas. And that's the first thing I do is say, are you going to guarantee me a shark? <laughs> and whatever they do, those dive masters, somehow they're like, hey, 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 there's a shark. And it's like, Woo and everybody else is like, using up their air and taking off, and sure. I'm just hanging out. This? But, you know, the last time I went diving, I went, we ran into three sharks and they were all sleeping. I'm like, wake up, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone's like, calm down. <laughs> uh, but, if yeah, this doesn't me. describe you, just, I just, I adore you. And I'm so excited. I'm so excited to just be in, in your presence in your company and to be in conversation with you. So here's here's our cute meat story. I was doing a keynote up in Kananaskis, Canada for the results um, uh, Beck's conference. And in the middle of, you know, the beginning of my keynote, I always I often will invite the audience, like, just ask questions throughout. Let's not wait to the end. I can handle it. You know, I usually make some joke about, I, you know, 10 years of improvs and have a healthy case of ADHD. And 99.999% of the time, no one will take me up on it until we get way into the session and they feel a little bit more comfortable. Janice is off in the corner. <laughs> and as soon as she was like, I have a question. <laughs> and I think I said something like, I'm in awe of you and I'm a little terrified of you, yeah, but I want to know you, more. You were scared. <laughs> <laughs> and at that moment, people were like, what, what is happening? What's going on? And so that there was a lot of laughter. Yeah. And so that, that was how we met was you were, you know, now that I know more about you, I'm like that, that moment totally makes sense that you're like, yeah, I have a question. Let's get into this. And, um, and so then we had the opportunity to talk afterwards. And that's when I learned more about the work you do. Um, and are so passionate about and wanted to make sure that we had you on the show for us to explore. So thank you, Janice, for saying yes. Well, it's interesting, because typically, when someone says, Well, what do you do? What's your background? And then I start talking about that I work in a hospice where people die, they um, and I deal with families that are um, very, very emotionally 
um, taxed and dealing with a really sensitive topic in a very vulnerable time, everybody goes silent and they mm. don't want to talk to me anymore. Mm. But you, you stayed talking to me and you wanted to hear more. So it was like, I, somebody wants to hear about <laughs> the, the specialty of palliative. I'll share what I have. I love it. So yeah, so this is really a privilege. It's quite exciting for me because it's, um, that's the one thing we have in common where mm. we may be, you know, of different ethnic backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds, whatever it may be. But um, the one thing that we have in common is that um, one day we will all uh, die um, and go through a lot of different kinds of experiences. And most people have no experience in yeah. dying. And so um, I have the privilege to work mm -hmm. here um, and um, work with many people that go through this. And they are so flipping honest. They share so mm -hmm. much with me that um, and it, it is a privilege to walk with them through this process. Um, and I've learned a lot, um, and it is so thrilling to be here, um, and that people let you into their private life, life sure. because it is a very personal experience. It's just like delivering a baby. It's like one of those private times, yeah. right? And they need someone to help sometimes, um, and they're willing to trust you, and it ends at life. Um, they're willing to trust me and my team, and uh, my team is just phenomenal. It's just um, people just can't thank you enough. Mm. It just makes the world a difference. It would I would imagine that I mean it you know just because of the nature of the work and knowing that in you know most cases there is going to be some loss and there will be a death and there will be the grief left behind of the people who loved them. That I would imagine it attracts a very specific type of person. Talk to me a little bit, Janice, about your journey. You know, did you know you always wanted to be in this space, um, or what? What were some of the moments that shaped you um, in pulling you towards this type of work? Because again, I can just like you said. I mean, even just the conversation of it. People don't know what to do with it and um, much less talk about it. Imagine working in it day in and day out. So what, what was your journey to this place? Oh, because I've been in nursing a long time. Um, I started out in acute care and we'd have some really complex patients. I was on general surgery and um, people were close to dying. And there were all these weird rules. Like I'd have someone who, you know, believed in their afterlife and they want to bring their moccasins with them. And we had policies mm. that they weren't with, they weren't allowed to or they mm. wanted to wear their parka when they died. And I'd get in trouble because I'd break the rules all the time. And I would put the parka on and mm. then my boss would come and give me heck. <laughs> And I'm like, somehow I don't fit in the box. I got to figure out how to fit in the box. And of course, time changed and palliative was just developing. Um, and um, I sort of latched onto that going, there's got to be a place where I can bring in colored quilts and do these things. And I can bring in the cat and the dog and it doesn't matter. Mm. Um, it's part of the family. Um, and so maybe not in acute care because we're, you know, really focusing on curative. Um, and then I got into some home care where we provided palliative care in the home and uh, then started looking at other kinds of opportunities and so got into um, hospice care. And then I was really fortunate. I got to um, work in a, an area where there was 82 towns and I had to set up a program um, uh, and introduce palliative care into 82 different towns. Mm -hmm. And so I had to use different nursing skills to be able to develop not only a program, but implement it, evaluate it, um, educate physicians, educate nurses, um, home care staff, et cetera, and get a program up and going where you could measure your outcomes and ensure that families were happy. You could work with the police department. You could work with the ambulance department and such. And again, it just filled my cup. It mm. was so exciting. Um, and the staff, because you, you get the right staff, right? And they're, they're all, they're all happy. They love what they do. They, they're passionate. And, you know, although you work in a very, um, emotionally trying, uh, area, um, and it can be, emotionally fatigue the staff were just full of energy and mm. full of happiness and so cheerful um sure they experience loss and sadness but they're just so delightful to work and you just see people blossom going i love working mm. in palliative care and even like when i do performance appraisals with staff they're just like i just love what i do i just mm. love it so much and my my physicians that currently i work with they are passionate about palliative care. So there's a lot of excitement at end of life, even though it is sad yeah. um, because it's such a subspecialty. And um, all I can say is people are super duper honest. Um, they mm. are so honest. They got nothing to lose. So when they share stuff with you at, in such a vulnerable moment, 
they, I mean, they'll tell you, they're like, I hate your hair color. (laughs) (laughs) You're like, I love it. (laughs) I love the honesty, right? Um, But they also appreciate things um, that we sometimes take for granted. Um, Like they'll go out in the courtyard and, um, you know, the flowers in full bloom and they they notice the smell right away. Mm. The sun is shining on their face and they're just like, oh my goodness, Janice, this is so beautiful. This is just so amazing. They just sort of stopped and they're really present in the moment and uh, take time to appreciate everything until their last breath. And you're like, wow, they are living life to their Mm. fullest. And, you know, a lot of them, um, they aren't discontent. They're just like, you know, it's the end of my life. um, And, um, you know, I've had a really great life. Um, The family's grieving and the family's having a difficult time. And so a lot of your energy is working towards working, supporting the family. And also, I mean, the subspecialty of palliative um, involves a lot of people as they go into system failure. Sure. They get clusters of symptoms. And so you need a little bit of a a special body of knowledge of knowing which kind of drugs and non-pharmacological products to help people get um, comfortable. And we do some really fun things like we've got starlight therapy going and we use these special lights and um, lots of Reiki and massage Mm. and, you know, the cool stuff, aromatherapy, plus like the medical management kinds of stuff too. Um, so yeah, lots of, lots of cool things. Um, and hospice has got a whole different approach too. like, there's all kinds of what we call wraparound services to give people a real, um, let's see, super quality at the end of life. Like, Mm. you know, I had one lady and, you know, like, what's the end of your life? Like, what's the most important thing to you? Like, what would you like to do? She's like, I've never worn cowboy boots. Like totally, (laughs) you know, (laughs) totally catches you off guard. I had another lady, she wanted to ride a Harley, right? Like you just, you just never know you're expecting something else, right? Something maybe more spiritual, like something deep, see my last daughter or, you know, but no, put on some cowboy boots and it's like, okay, we can do that. That's an easy one. So people, you know, people are amazing and fun to work with. And um, when they share these things at end of life, you're always surprised. It's never dull. There's Mm -hmm. always something. But there's also difficult times because sometimes the symptoms are really complicated and um, there's lots of ethical dilemmas. Uh, But again, you know, that's the skills that you have to sort of help work through those processes and complex situations. And you pull your whole team together and uh, work with the families closely um, and um, try and work through it the best you can. Yeah. When you, you know, when you think about all the experiences you've had and all the moments you've witnessed and, um, you know, and the conversations you've had, what, you know, if you had a a wand to have people have different kinds of conversations around death, dying, end of life, what would you, what would you want for people? You know, I know that, um, in my own experience, right. Um, in a place where parents are aging, so right, becoming much more aware of that. And I can see them becoming more aware of their aging, um, and their mortality in a different way. Like we were just at a a family event, and mom was like, we're the old people, like we're, we're the next shelf, right? Like we're, we're, we're the old ones. And, you know, and, um, and so, you know, I've witnessed, I've witnessed the avoidance, and, and that's part of what drew me to to having you on the show. And also when we had the other person is I'm trying to push myself even of like, how do I have different conversations about this? How, how do I get to a place of acceptance? Because this is the inevitability, right? It's the one yeah. thing that's true. We don't know what happens on the other side of it. We don't know what our life is going to be leading up to that moment. But that is the one thing that is true. So with your, with your experience, what do you wish um, or what would you hope for? for people to think about um, and how they think about approach death and dying? Well, it's probably um, twofold. Like the first thing is that that people do have the comfort and start talking about it. Because you talk about it early, you watch a show and someone dies. And how did that happen? How did your kids react, right? Mm. How did your brother, your sister react? Or how would you feel if you were in that moment, right? Somebody was in a car accident and you lost that person suddenly and you didn't have time to sort of prepare yourself like a slow death, right? Mm. Or um, someone you thought that you were very prepared for was dying. Like I've got an elderly father-in-law who's 95 and you think, think, think he's going to go. You think, think, Mm. think he's going to go. And then all of a sudden up and about, he's doing well. And it's, you know, it's it's like a roller coaster Mm. and it's... 
he just keeps on going and he's doing okay and then he does poorly and you just keep going and he goes another year so you never know um in those situations so um, from from a wish list, it's just um, having people to start talking about it and being comfortable. You know, I, I made a joke about when I say what I do and people go dead silent. Um, and and it's really uncomfortable for them. Just me telling them what my job is makes yeah. them uncomfortable or they're like, oh, that must be awful. Um, and I'm like, why would you think it would be awful? Mm. Tell me more about mm. what, what your thoughts are about death and dying. And then they mm. get really uncomfortable. Um, so that would be probably my, my one wish, right? And there's many ways ways of um, having those conversations with your families, your loved ones, because sooner or later, you're supposed to write a will. And sooner or later, you know, you're supposed to write something about what your personal direct is, what you want want to happen um, when you can't, if you can't make decisions yourself at end of life, or you have to make decisions on behalf of someone else. And when you start talking to them, people have very different beliefs from one another. And if you don't have those open, um, open conversations, um, you may not be honoring what they want, mm. or they're, what they want is not realistic, right? Like they want to you know go up the top of a mountain and they're like they're already in multi-system failure it's just not possible there's no running water yeah running, those kinds of things the second thing is um there a lot of people as they um get closer and closer to death they often have lots of it may be spiritual or existential um questions because hmm. they may you know be a uh, atheist or just trying to figure out what the purpose is of their whole existence hmm. and that's a pretty heavy question um at end of life and you're you know you're just doing your first shift and you're like holy moly getting hit with that kind of a question hmm. so um just having people have the opportunity to be able to find purpose and and feel like they've had a meaningful life so that magic wand would be um if i had that superpower to help people to sort through those existential questions um questions and i know a lot of our spiritual care workers are really good at helping people to explore that and get deeper but a lot of people they can manage the pain they can manage all the other symptoms sometimes the delirium but that meaning behind mm. life when they're, um, you know, sitting there quietly um, in their last moments. Um, and a lot of times it comes back to family and friendships and love and, you know, all those things that we sometimes even take for granted. Um, and then sometimes it's just small things like nature and such. Um, but a lot of you'll see commonly um, at end of life, people start talking about that and um, just having that skill to be comfortable to go through those existential questions I think is so so valuable and you know then when they close their eyes they just look so peaceful mm. they're just happy and content and but that's not the case all the time because sure. sometimes deaths aren't always that nice yeah yeah it's um yeah those are I mean those are heavy questions even when you're thinking about them in a healthy state right yeah. and right yeah. those are big questions of what's what is what is the meaning of all this what is what is my purpose what why do i exist um and sometimes i think it can be seductive for us to not slow down to answer those right you just get busy and you're, you're moving through life and you're doing the next thing in front of you instead of pausing and saying is this is this what i want you know one of the things i'm i'm curious about is you know what are what are some of those like in addition to the the spiritual questioning um, or exploration. What are what are some of the other? I don't want to say topics, but what are some of the other things that come up? You know, when you're working with people who are, you know, very aware that they're facing the end of their life. You know, I think that when I think about my experience with loved ones in particular, it was either you know situations where people went really fast and um, you know didn't have that, and or the illness sort of took over quickly, even if it was not a quick uh, death, right? So they were sick for a very long time. Um, but what are, you know, I'm just, I'm, 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 I'm just curious to know, like, what, what are some of those reflections that people like, often have when they're at that point of, okay, like, I'm, I'm in a position where I'm actually aware that this is the end, right? Like, medically, we know that there's yeah. nothing more, we know that this is happening. Um, so people do a lot of um, what's called legacy work or ethical wills. Um, hmm. And what they do, um, uh, and, uh, you know, it's too bad they didn't start earlier, but it's, it's like they're writing their book, right? Hmm. Their their autobiography. But they, they want to leave things for 
um, say a grieving wife, um, and they write this beautiful heartfelt song or story or just memories of all the things that they've done that were really magical and special, and they put their heart and soul into it, um, and then we support them through that writing process. And story after story, and then they share it with their, their wife, and then years later, like they're, they, they, the wife takes that out, and they're like, they can hear their voice mm. in it almost, right? Um, or share it with their grandchildren or their children, and it's all those magic moments that um, you kind of forget when that when your loved one's gone. And so that work, that journey, they're at the end of the life, and they walk through that process of all those things. And some people are so gifted, like they're, they're, we get um, in our facility. There's some really incredible people, you know, from psychologists to farmers to truck drivers and the stories they have and at this time because they're dealing again you know like that existential question um word is they start thinking about all the great things that they've done or important things Mm. or the the stories they want to share with their kids or lessons in life so that their kids know what to do Mm. um and they they capture it in writing and from the families that exercise when they take that back and um, when they read it, you could just see all the tears flowing from their eyes, but uh, tears of happiness almost going, oh, I forgot about that. Mm. And they laugh or mm. it just touches their heart. But that legacy work um, and ethical will writing, um, they take back and it, it keeps that um, memory alive. Um, you know, and when I sometimes instead of, you know, saying you know, my condolences, I said, remember to celebrate their life. Mm. And those kinds of little tools gives people you know, I didn't think about that. That was so fun because instead of thinking just about the sad things going, I'm going to miss him a lot or mm. I'm going to miss her a lot. But these things are so, they were so great memories. And that was a gift to me. And having it in writing in their handwriting is a special gift. Mm. So that that's, a, I think, really, really important work. And um, in that work, when I said, you know, my magic wand, I'd wish people could, you know, reach uh, the answers to those existential questions. That actually is one of those superpowers in my toolkit that does work um, and works in palliative care. It's not just my toolkit. It's um, many, many people to to do that legacy work um, and to start early um, and really, really fun. I mean, you've had people that are, you know, really musically gifted and they're like, I'm going to write my wife a song. And it's like they're at the very end of life. I'm not needing to make you cry. Oh, my goodness. No, keep talking, and I'll just share what's coming up for me. They're at the very end of the life, and they're like, I just got this inspiration. And they write this love song to their wife Mm. and on their last breath. And you're like, oh, my lordy lord. And it's just like they share it with my team, and it's just beautiful. Like, we've even had flipping weddings here. We've had weddings, two weddings. I love weddings, that. I love you know? that. Like it's so, it's just so amazing. But yeah, so some of that work is really, really important. Um, uh, we have a music therapist too. Um, and um, she can bring out some special, special things in people that they just open up. It's not just, you know, they're singing along yeah. and, um, you know, shaking their head, clapping their hands. Um, it just gets to a deeper point in their heart and soul and they open up and they're just like, that's exactly what I needed right now. Mm. Um, things were just not going very well. And, you know, I was experiencing a lot of pain and sim- and, and nausea. Um, but that music, it just brought back memories of when, you know, when I first met my wife or when I had my first baby and, or, you know, those kinds of things. Yeah. We do get really hard situations where we get really young like mm. you know like an 18 year old or a 17 year old um and you know you've got the mom and the grandparents here and it's out of order right it's sure. kind of messed up yeah because they it should be the older people dying um and that that can tug on people's hearts because they sometimes you, you know you need to um take time to say that's not your life it's somebody mm. else's life so mm. make sure you've got your professional boundaries um but that can be really hard on the staff as well um, um, and, 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 you know, visitors coming in when they see such a young person, cause they're always like, oh, you work in hospice. It's all old people. It's like, yeah. absolutely not. It's yeah. we have a lot of young people, right? Because, yeah. you know, it's just part of life, um, death. It's, uh, no, I think part of, you know, part of my emotions coming up was, as I was hearing you talk, <clears throat> I was first introduced to the idea of ethical wills, um, at an event I used to run. Uh, that was like a presentation, kind of like a TEDx, but it was called Pachakcha, and somebody talked about ethical wills, and it was the first time I'd ever heard of that that term. But 
you know, the, some of the emotions, there was layers of the emotions, right? Um, you know, thinking about how we don't often slow down enough to share those things while we're present and yeah. with, with people. And, you know, I think what, like for me, what part of what was causing my emotion was how many people I wish in my life I had that, right? Like yeah. people who have passed on that I'm like, oh, I wish I had her voice or I wish I yeah. could still like hear their perspective. And, you know, and, and that's something I think for me as I, um, you know, hit certain milestones, right? Yeah. Like you know, starting to hit middle age and, you know, and my, you know, having siblings who are right, like hitting 50 yeah. and suddenly it's like, oh, wait a second, you know, we're, we're in the second half of our life definitely opens up a different perspective. At least it has for me of just how do we, how do we be more present? How do we share those things? How do we pass on those legacies? How do we, when we're in the moment with people, make sure that they know how much we appreciate them. And even if that's vulnerable and hard and emotional, right, yeah. to to do that. And so I've definitely been finding myself um, trying to push myself more of like, let's not wait, like, let's not wait till the end. Let's not and we might not get that. We might not get that privilege. Um, so I appreciate you, you sharing. And if there's other things that um, maybe if you can just really quickly just talk about what an ethical will is for um, audience because they might not be familiar with that term. I think that the the descriptions of the other things you've been speaking to, like, oh, that makes sense. But how would you define an ethical will to somebody who's unfamiliar? Um, it's it's writing out the things that are really important to a person um, and what they want um, their loved ones to learn about them mm. and to think about them when then when they're gone. Um, and share the things they feel are so important um, that uh, when they're gone, they won't be able to share with you. Mm. Um, and it can be anything from their heritage to their life experiences to things that they're, you know, you better go to school and get a university yeah. education. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes it's not just about them. It's about th what they expect of, of other people. Um, and it's, it, it it's their voice mm -hmm. and it's it's um it's very in depth about what they feel and they think mm -hmm. um and um uh, it ends up helping the people that are grieving who love them and are close um the most i mm -hmm. think i mean i think the whole process going through it um people are just like they're overjoyed um with with when they start talking and listening and hearing um, what someone wants to share in an ethical will and everyone's ethical wills a little bit different and unique and they take different approaches depending on on the individual but in the end um, the people that um, uh, are close to them they feel like they got something very very important very very mm -hmm. um, special um, uh, and it changes both of them it changes mm -hmm. all of them forever going through the process so you know sometimes it's not the end product, the will, it, the ethical will itself. It, it was spending that time, mm. sharing that time to get this memory. And then when they leave um, and they, their loved one has um, passed and died, they now have that and they, they cherish that time. Mm. And when they're having, you know, what people will often say when they've done an ethical will, um, and come back and talk about it is like I was having a really bad day and I just was wishing my husband was right here with me. They pull mm -hmm. out that ethical will and they read it and they're like, and it just, it made them cry, but it just made them stronger. Yeah. It is pretty powerful. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, this, you know, all of this stuff is why it's so important for us to normalize, right? How do we show up in these moments? How do we talk about it more? How do we, um, you know, I think something that I've observed in, there's my dog wanting to say hello, but what I've observed <laughs> sometimes is, you know, maybe we go into denial about the reality of where someone is and there's a, no, we're not, I mean, this isn't the end. We're instead of just how do we embrace that journey and also on some level, just embrace the temporariness. <laughs> that's, yeah. Is that a word? The temporary <laughs> quality. It's kind of not, but that's It's okay. not, but <laughs> we're going to make it. The, the temp <laughs> like the, the fact that our lives are temporary, right? Um, and, you know, one of the things that I was curious to get your thoughts on, because one of the things we had talked about back up in Kenanaskis is the fact that 
Um, and you'll, you'll have to catch me up on like the history, but um, Canada has moved to having some end of life op- options, right? If I yeah. uh, understand that correctly. And that, you know, that is something that I think is, um, feels like a taboo topic, uh, feels, uh, I mean, certainly there's ethical, like I get the ethical dilemmas. And as um, it's something actually that, you know, my husband and I, we, we you know, we talk about and, um, you know, just from the standpoint of like, when I think about things like assisted suicide or whatever, you know, like that's sort yeah. of how, you know, back in the 90s, it was Dr. Kevorkian yeah. down in, right? You know, it was such a scary thing. And, and I think that when you've experienced, hmm, when you've experienced loved ones suffer so much, suffer so yeah. greatly, and that there was an awareness that there was yeah. n- there was no place that this was going to get better, you start to question and go, "Man, is this about quantity of life or is this about quality of life?" And there is something for me personally, my personal opinion, really beautiful about having that op that option yeah. um to yeah. to 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 control your journey a bit right obviously not in a situation if somebody's struggling from like a mental health perspective but um you know i've seen situations where um and just just reframing it for myself even so i'm i'm curious just to hear about you know w- what is it that has shifted in canada what how have the conversation shifted what have you observed um as those options have become more available and not and i say that but there's still like a rigorous process of approval and right all of that but just like okay. just educate us on on okay. what's going on up there okay well and, and i always um put a a, a solid line between, um, and I'm going to use the word made, um, and palliative care. Because palliative yeah. care is comfort and symptom management. But there is a, a, a pre- procedure that people can apply for uh, to um, end their life peacefully. Um, and uh, that is done very ethically. And um, it's an option for people. And exactly as you said, it's really great to have that option. It isn't palliative care, but in many palliative settings, if people choose that, and I, I mean, people do that with their pets all the time, yeah. um, and they have that opportunity. And um, what is it has done um, in a very positive way is given people a lot more control. A lot of people like may just, you know, they may contemplate it. They have it set up. Um, and they may say, you know what, I'm just sticking with palliative care. Mm. Um, and if I need it, I know that it's available. Um, and then others have said, you know what, today's the day. Mm. Today's the day. I've, I've seen everyone. Mm. I have all my existential questions are answered. I feel good. Um, and I just, you know what, it's, it's time to go. I mean, I've seen opposite where people have just willed themselves to without any procedure. Yeah. Um, but, um, I think it's just given people other options and given them a good sense of control. I mean, I know there's a lot of, um, different spiritualities, um, yeah. and, um, it's not, a lo- doesn't align with everyone's belief. Um, and, but we have a diverse world, um, with many different people with many different beliefs, and that's an option that works for some of them. Um, but it is a, a procedure that is not part of palliative care, but it's a procedure that we can, we always will make available in palliative care. Um, it doesn't take away that you've got a family that's grieving. Um, they've just lost someone. Someone, you know, was ultimately going to go into multi-system failure. Mm. The end is the end is the same, but it gives them some, some sort of control and they can choose the time the date and all of that and be greatly supported. So, uh, you know, in my, again, I'm going to own this one in personal opinion. It gives us a, a really great option. Um, however, I, I'm always clear that that isn't part of palliative care. Yeah. Palliative care is about quality of life, um, good symptom management, et cetera. But there is a procedure available for them so that they can maintain that control and choose the time and date they want to go. And um, it's done uh, in a beautiful manner. Um, and, um, everyone's treated exactly the same, mm-hmm. um, and they have a really high quality of life, uh, at end of life. Um, and, um, when they decease, mm-hmm. you know, um, it, the treatment is 
completely the same. Like the mm. processes are all the same. Sure. Yeah. But it's nice to have that option. And um, I'm glad that Canada is open. Um, I know I, when in my old or younger days, and we used to always study what was going on in Holland and places yeah. where they didn't have palliative care. And they only had, um, they called it euthanasia back then. Um, as an option it was horrible like yeah. just that's the only option and there were all kinds of you know the procedure wasn't you know always fine-tuned and all that kind of stuff so the world has changed completely and so it's nice to see that we have great um, quality of care and i'd like to see more of it and it should be more available um, to um, people when they need it uh, in a timely manner um, but there is that option and gives people that sense of control uh, of their life. And um, I think that's really um, a good thing. Yeah, it's I mean, you know, you, you mentioned how uh, we we have that option with pets. And, yeah. and it's uh, we last uh, a year ago, February, um, we had to put down our uh, first dog. And I <laughs> this, I don't just, you know, like this, I, I'm embracing and just leaning into it, and I will not apologize for tears. So this is me catching myself because <laughs> um, they're normal and healthy and natural. But like we were home, he was in my lap. Yeah. Right. My husband and I were together. And, and I after it was over, I remember being like, this is how I want to go out. Like if yeah. I obviously there are things that happen, there's accidents that happen, who knows what our future is. But there was something really beautiful about he was suffering. It yeah. was very clear he was suffering. Like it was, yeah. there was no, no alternative, right? It was only going to be suffering more. Yeah. And like, there was something so beautiful uh, and, and peaceful as hard as it was, there was something so peaceful about being there for his last breath and knowing he was yeah. just absolutely surrounded by love and in his safe spot. And all I kept thinking was like, man, if this, if there, there's an option, right? If I get to a point where I go, I feel complete or, and, yeah. and I don't say that flippantly, right? Like, but, or, or there's a situation where you go, the, the future is not like the future is going to become really bad because of, of, of diagnoses or medical. Like there is something I think really beautiful. And I think coming from a culture that I was born into and yeah. raised into where we just don't talk about it that much. We don't talk yeah. about death and, and just normalizing like what, what does that look like so that somebody has options so that we can be with each other. So we can really celebrate with each other and, and, and have that um, be a, um, what do I want to say? Like an acceptance of that's part of our journey, right? There's something so, powerful about um, being present with somebody or somebody not wanting people to be present with. I know that this is something that uh, my colleague and Teresa and I, we talk about is some people don't want to pass with people around them, right? They're, you know, yeah. they, they want their own space or they want whatever. Um, and I just, that I, happens. That does happens. it? Yeah. Yeah. Cause some people will stay there 24 seven. And as soon as they go and uh, leave the room to use the washroom and their loved one mm. says, Oh, I can finally die. They're mm. out of the room and they just go to sleep. And you're like, I think they did that intentionally. They, she would not leave that room. Yeah. It's like, oh, you know, so I do think that happens. Um, but, you know, with your example, with uh, the beauty of the pet, I've seen that with um, people that mm. have just used palliative care mm. um, and and not any treatment. It was just yeah. a beautiful, that's a good death, a beautiful death, right? Um, and we've seen ones that aren't so beautiful, but um, also within palliative care, we have, um, I always call them the super drugs um, that uh, we can help people um, using stuff like palliative sedation, get into a really deep sleep. And, and get them really comfortable if yeah. their symptoms um, are, are difficult to manage. And so our team is really, really good at that. So there are other options in palliative care, but it's good to have um, a, a lot of tools in your toolkit for end of life. Yeah. And um, going back to your comment, you know, what, wishing for people to talk about it, be more open. A lot of, most people, because they haven't died, they, they don't have an experience in it. And, yeah. and it's uncomfortable talking about something you don't know anything about, right? You're only guessing. Um, and so, and you know, you get, when you start talking to people that have seen a number of deaths and are more comfortable with it, then people start getting a little bit more comfortable to say, well, what does it look like when they, yeah. you know, when they're, you know, breathing stop or starts to slow down or what's that sound when like that ugly sound when it's so gurgly mm. and, and you'll 
say, oh, it's just a little bit of fluid. They're not in pain. Yeah. But a lot of people have never seen it or experienced it. So when they see it in their loved one, they think, oh, oh something sure. terrible is happening. And, it, you know, sometimes it's not that bad at all. But you just need to explain it, right? Because they have never seen it before. Yeah. I, I would imagine that you, you know, you're probably really tuned into the science of dying. You know, that's something I feel like when I've maybe heard other people talk or, um, of just, you know, or again, having my own loved ones and having somebody from like, say, hospice or palliative care, like, you know, we don't know, because we've never been through it. And they're like, no, these are the signs, right? And here's what we know of where the body is, or here's what to expect. And even to normalize that of like, here's what might happen once they have passed. Because otherwise, you I mean, most, most people will not have experienced that. But, you know, people, the human body is amazing. Like, I just, like, sometimes, you know, you think you know it all, and then you're surprised. Like, I can remember this lady, um, and she hadn't eaten for weeks and weeks, and we, you know, like, almost like in a coma, sto- a coma state. Like, she'd open up her eyes occasionally. Um, and, um, you know, we were just counting maybe, you know, four more days, five more days. And her granddaughter arrived on a weekend. She sat up and ate an ice cream cone. <laughs> and I'm like, that's impossible. <laughs> impossible. But people, like, mm. t- the human mind and what what wills people, and that's, again, going back to that existential stuff, I don't get it, but people are always impress mm. me, always impress me. There's always these things, and you're like, wow, being human is just such a pleasure. You know, we're so lucky. We don't know it. So we should, you know, live each day fully because um, this experience, when it ends, it's gone. Like the human experience, the smell, the taste, like the things mm. to feel sensation, feel soft blankets, like all those things. Um, and when you're dealing with end of life, those little things like giving them a warm blanket or a soft mm. blanket, changing their pillow or giving them some ginger ale or whatever it may be. So sip a beer at the end of life. It's so meaningful to mm. them. And you're like, that's just a simple pleasure. But yeah. when you, you know, a little bit more present, slow down things, those little things are important that somebody, you know, it's that human connection, right? Yeah. Um, and especially for us, because um, we see people in our hospice environment in the last three months of life. So we have no relationship and you want to build that relationship really quickly. And they trust you so Mm. quickly and they're so open and honest. And I'm like, how can this happen? We can have this Mm. great relationship in such a short time. Um, But because they're so honest and of course, you know, we want to help and and prepare um, them for the, for what's going to happen. You just become really entwined. um, And so it it actually is a very, very rewarding career. So um, I am blessed uh, to and honor to have this opportunity to spend with people um, that are at end of life and they invite me into their life. Mm. And I'm like, wow, how can this be so, so good? Like people trust me that much. So I, it is really a privilege and an honor. So I'm glad. I'm like, I uh, I have a, a good life. And when people say, I don't want to talk about your job, I'm like, why not? It's really great. <laughs> <laughs> you are such, Janice, you're such a gift. And I, I could keep asking you lots of questions. And I also want to be really thoughtful of the time that we've, you know, we've taken with you. Um, I just really appreciate your perspective. And I think it's such a valuable one. And, um, and there's just so many lessons to take from from this conversation. And unfortunately, I think sometimes it does take losing somebody to be like, gosh, we need to spend more time, we need to say I love you more, mm-hmm. we need to write, slow down more. And then what happens is and then eventually we get on autopilot, which I think is some part of the human mechanism of survival. <laughs> like, yeah. So we aren't in an existential crisis all the time. Um, but it's such a, you know, it's a good reminder. And um and just really fascinating to hear about the work you're doing. So thank you so much for coming on the show and, and talking with us. There's um, no doubt, no doubt lots of people will be probably curious about more after they hear this. Um, but in the spirit of, of us winding down our conversation, there's a question we always ask everyone, and I'm curious to hear yours, your okay. answer to this. And that is, uh, you know, knowing that our conversations can transform us, what is a conversation you've had with yourself or maybe with someone else that was transformative for you? Um, probably would be is Um, I was with a gentleman uh, who was atheist, and uh, he just 
He's like, I wish I was spiritual. I wish I could grab onto something. I need something. I don't get it. Like what's going to mm-hmm. happen, you know? And, um, so the, we sat down and I said, well, how about if we just bring some, one of those spiritual leaders and it could be a chaplain. I don't know what faith, but let's just explore it. Right. And, um, and that, um, moment transformed him completely. Mm. He's like, he was so, and he's dying, right? He's actively yeah. dying. Um, and so unsettled. Um, and you know, he was having spiritual distress, uh, and just didn't know where, uh, to channel his energy. Mm. I mean, we had his symptoms, all his palliative, um, sim- physical symptoms well managed, but his soul, we hadn't fed his soul mm. and, uh, he didn't know what to do. And he, you know, he was a confirmed atheist, but he just, needed to latch on to something um and by working through um some spiritual distress uh he was able to settle himself Mm. uh i mean he had changed his belief system but he just found uh he was able to focus and just be more resolved and just said you know he's just more settled he's like now he has something to hang his hat off Mm. uh, hat on um and he had wished he was spiritual but he wasn't and and you know he couldn't change but he found a different outlet and was very very happy um and it was just through it was probably three different conversations but it asked um it answered some of his questions about you know what the meaning of life is and you know what 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 is this all about in this world and now that he's taking his last breath and um he was very content Mm. and so that like witnessing that and Mm. being you know, privilege to that vulnerable moment because not everybody's going to fess up, right? And yeah. they've just met someone. And to allow me to bring in someone really spiritual to someone who's atheist, but to see that transformation, um, it blew me out of the water going, you know what? Like, you got to try things. You got to try things different. You got to think out of, outside of the box. And that's okay. I mean, this is palliative care and we needed to bring him comfort and nothing else was working, but this worked. And yeah. I, I witnessed it and, mm. and it helped him so much. And so I'm like, okay, just never give up and always think, you know, it may not be what you define as spirituality, but something, there's always something that somebody can latch on to. Yeah. So for me, that was quite transformational just because I'm, I witnessed it um, from someone who was in total total distress to someone yeah. who said i'm okay now hmm. i'm i'm okay thank you very much thank you that I, really really helped what i love about that story too is sometimes and boy this is a conversation for another day so i'm going to just like point at the door but we're not going to go through it <laughs> <laughs> is you know is when we say when when you hear phrases like spirituality i think it can be easy to think of organized religion and that's not always the same thing no and, he's standing on a mountain right right and so, Watching the moon. yeah, I, I, you know, so that's, that's what I, I also like, um, I think is so beautiful too, is just this exploration of, you know, spirituality can look very different for different people. And it doesn't always have to be uh, a belief in an entity or a, right, like a organized religion in the way that we know it. But, um, but just that Mind deep you- sense of meaning. I saw this, this, she's a researcher and she, um, she was really into the spirituality and the soul when the soul leaves the body and she, um, was capturing it on camera. Mm-hmm. So it was really interesting. She's a researcher and capturing, I don't know how the, the image, imagery, how mm-hmm. she did it, but that's what she studied and focused in. And there's a lot of research in that area. Mm-hmm. And she was using special techniques to capture the soul leaving the body. I'm like, this is really weird. <laughs> <Woo>. <laughs> But, open open I mean, the windows. There's a science behind it, right? <laughs> Going, okay. But, yeah, yeah. Like, so it's like, yeah. there's a lot out there we don't understand. Yeah. And it just makes it a really interesting world. Yeah, for sure. I just like, for me, curiosity is such a big thing. I'm like, I don't, I don't know what happens on the other side, but I'm going to be real open and curious to experience whatever it is. Like, there's nothing, there's nothing I can do to answer it now. So just yeah. like, you know, live the life I'm meant to live and, and show up in that moment and discover, right? Whatever's yeah. on the other side of it. Janice, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for just being you. Thank you for your energy. Thank you for your passion. And thank you for the clear love that you bring to the people at a time when they need it most. So thank you so much. And maybe I can get you to go shark diving. You never know. I I mean, I, I've never scuba dived, but uh, I, I am not opposed to it. I just have never done it. And I feel like going with you would be great. They're pretty cool. (laughs) Like really, that's the weirdest uh, just thing. Just put me in a head. cage. I'll go in a cage, and oh, I can, that's no. what the great white. Yeah, you know, oh yeah, you can do that. That's <laughs> come on, that's like a pet. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, 
I will not say no. I just need to learn how to scuba dive if I'm going to join you sometime. But I'm, I'm, I love, I, I love that that is something you love. I just think it's so, so fantastic. And I love that we've come full circle in our conversation and that we are ending it where we started. It's a really like beautiful storytelling, Janice. Well, thank you so much uh, for saying yes and being on okay. the show. Okay. Thank you very much. Our guest this week has been Janice Chabonik talking about the very comfortable, uncomfortable conversation of death and dying. And um, there's just there's I just have a lot of feels going on about this conversation. But boy, if I had the choice, I would love to have someone like her walking alongside me and my family um, when when and if when that day comes. So I just want to thank her for everything that she does and gives. And I realized that I didn't ask her how people can reach out to her. So um, we will put her email. She did give us uh, permission to put her email in the show notes. So if you have questions, or if you want to reach out, she loves talking about this. She also, you know, loves talking about sharks. So if you're interested in that as well, you can do that. So we'll put that in the show notes. And we want to hear from you. Um, We love when we receive emails, uh, whether it's questions or whether it's people sharing about what resonated for them. So you can always do that by sending me an email at podcast at sarahnollwilson.com, or you can find me on social media where my DMs are always open. And if you'd like to support the show, You can do that in two ways. The first is to please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your preferred podcast platform. This helps us get increased exposure and to be able to bring on great guests like Janice and have these conversations. And the second way is you can become a patron. You can go to patreon.com slash conversations on conversations where your financial contribution will support the amazing team that makes this possible. And you also get some pretty great swag. So a huge thank you to our team that makes this podcast possible, to our producer, Nick Wilson, to our sound editor, Drew Knoll, our transcriptionist, Becky Reinert, our marketing consultant, Caitlin Summit Nelson, and the rest of the Snowco crew. And just a big final wholehearted thank you to Janice Chabonik and just being the amazing human she is. This has been Conversations on Conversations. Thank you so much for listening. And remember, when we can change the conversations we have with ourselves and others, we can change the world. So please be sure to rest, rehydrate, and I'll see you again next week.